Hello and good evening, and welcome to Lehigh Valley Passport to History's monthly virtual program. I'm your host, George Wacker, with Lehigh Valley with Love Media. This series airs live on third Tuesdays, and we take about 30 minutes or so to highlight a different theme and discussion from the night's participating historic sites. Lehigh Valley Passport to History, you can see lvhistory.org right in front of you, is a partnership of 50 historic sites and resources in and around Pennsylvania's Lehigh and Northampton counties. The group helps to promote local tourism and shares historical activities, events, tours, and exhibitions throughout the Valley. You can see a lot of things that are going on here. Lehigh Valley Passport to History is funded in part with funding received through the County of Northampton's Hotel Tax Program, the Lehigh County Tourism Development Grant Program, and the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Visit lvhistory.org for more information. Tonight's program explores the Northampton County Historical and Genealogical Society's tour, virtual tour of Easton during uh, for Jewish heritage past and present. We have Sarah E. White, the Community Engagement Coordinator here. Hello, welcome. Hello everyone, thank you so much. I totally messed that up. Can you, <laughs> <laughs> and I apologize. Can you uh, tell me again, tell me the the uh, proper title of the, the full virtual tour. Yes, um, my name is Sarah White. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator with the Northampton County Historical and Genealogical Society. And the full name of the tour is From Past to Present, a Jewish history tour of Easton, Pennsylvania. And people can go to, and we're gonna put the link in the comments and we're gonna have a QR code for people who can take the whole tour. Can you, we're gonna just go over, you know, kind of cursory, go over some of it. Uh, it is very in depth. Can you give people a little bit of an explanation of how they can take the virtual tour themselves? Sure, so I'll give you um, a short introduction and a short how to, how to go about getting access to the tour. Um, and then we'll turn back over to George who will be the master of the PowerPoint tonight. Um, That's right. First, I would, I would like to, um, on behalf of NCHGS, extend our deepest thanks to all of our community partners and our supporters, um, to George and to Lehigh Valley Passport to History, um, as well as Elizabeth Rosen from Congregation B'nai Shalom who wrote the original tour that we have adapted. Um, Rabbi Joshua Trachtenberg of Blessed Memory, who wrote an initial history of Easton's Jewish heritage in 1944, um, as well as our members, our visitors, and our guests who have been wonderfully patient with us as we navigate uh, all the intricacies of virtual programming in the midst of this pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, so from past to present, a virtual tour of Jewish Easton covers over 300 years of Easton's Jewish history before Easton's founding in 1752, all the way up to the present day. The tour is completely self-guided and can be completed at your own pace. So you can do a couple stops in one sitting, put your phone down, go cook some dinner, and then come back to your tour, right? Um, most stops are located within the downtown historic district area between Scott Park and 6th Street. And we have provided exact addresses and or approximate locations um, should you wish to walk to the locations on your own. Citations, sources, and further reading are provided at the end of the tour. Um, additionally, many sections are given short introductions to just provide some background context that are relevant to the tour stops. Uh, right. Now, how you go about getting access to this tour, um, although the tour is virtual, all tickets much, must be purchased through Eventbrite, which is linked on our website, signalmuseum.org slash events. Um, you can scroll all the way to the bottom of the events page and you'll find our Jewish history tour there. When you order through Eventbrite, you will receive an access token with your order confirmation. You have to use this token that's in your confirmation to access the tour content on the Culture Connect platform. Um, now, the good news is that your token is valid through the entire month in which you purchase the token. Uh, so if you purchase it in the month of May, you can use it throughout May. June will then have a different code. Um, so it, it does seem a little bit complicated, um, but it really helps us from a membership standpoint and from a public engagement standpoint to see who is using our tours and whether or not they're successful. Um, and if you do have any technical troubles, please don't hesitate to call the museum. We're, we're all very knowledgeable about um, how to access the tour content. So we are here for you. And, and going through it on my own, I mean, I can't speak for everyone, but it was very easy for me to, to get access and go through it. So. Good. Uh, you know, without further ado, I want to get right into it and, and turn it over to you. Like you said, I will be 
um, handling the PowerPoint here. So, uh, Sarah, I, I'm going to turn it over to you now. You are in okay. charge. We're going to begin with slide number one. All right. So welcome everyone to a very shortened version of our tour of Easton's Jewish history. Jewish presence in the Easton area dates back over a century before the city's founding, um, which is remarkable considering that Easton was founded in 1752 before what is now the United States was even the United States. Um, our Jewish history begins with Scott Park overlooking the confluence of the Delaware and Lehigh rivers. In the 1650s, Dutchmen from New Amsterdam, or present-day New York, were exploring the area that would become Northampton County. Among those explorers was a group of Jewish refugees from Brazil who had made an agreement with the Dutch West India Company to stay and settle in New Amsterdam. This Brazilian group was the first established Jewish community in North America. On November 29, 1655, three of these explorers requested permission from the West India Company to travel and trade along the Delaware River. Although their request was denied, they were granted permission to send two others on a different expedition. This is where Easton's Jewish history begins. And the photo here we have, um, I don't have an exact date um, off the top of my head, but all of the credits and sources um, and permissions to use the images are found within the tour. So this is a very early, um, I believe a charcoal depiction of the confluence of the Delaware and Lehigh rivers. Um, next slide, please. The two explorers who were granted permission to travel from New Amsterdam, Isaac Israel and Benjamin Cardoso, likely pushed through to the confluence of the two rivers. The census records from 1780 indicate 103 taxable men living in Easton, of whom at least 11 identified as Jewish. Um, that equates to roughly 10% of the village's population. These statistics are fascinating in that it, they indicate that in revolutionary Easton, relative to its size, of course, um, Easton was more densely populated by Jews in proportion to its total population than any other American community at the time. The census also shows us that these men performed essential jobs for a new village, including the professions of baker, smith, mason, lawyer, and tavern keeper. Next slide, please. This photo shows an early depiction of the um, uh, Temple Covenant of Peace. Unfortunately, this structure is no longer there today. It was believed to have been the first um, rendition, if you will, that was located on Spring Garden Street in downtown Easton. Now, when the synagogue moved to um, 6th Street between Pine and Ferry Street, if you are there today, it is unfortunately is a now empty lot. Until recently, that was the location of uh, Temple Covenant of Peace, which was the 10th oldest Jewish congregation in the country. Although the location at 6th Street between Pine and Ferry would have been beyond the boundaries of 18th century Easton, it serves as a good starting point for a discussion of early religious life um, in this small frontier village. For 80 years, the Jewish community in Easton practiced without a formal congregation and without a formal synagogue. We do have evidence that Easton had a rabbi of some kind, though, although we don't know his name. Um, but we do know that in 1774, at a time when no other frontier community of its size would have had one, Easton's Jewish community had a rabbi. And we will turn to um, the discussions of this synagogue in future stops. Next slide, please. This is a record of some of the earliest um, uh, occupants of Easton among some of the first in 1750, one of which is Meyer Hart. Um, we know very little about Meyer Hart's uh, early life, and most of what we know is based on research and just educated conjecture. His full name was Meyer Hart de Shira. He was most likely from Portugal, and through tracing the evolution of his name, he may have been related to a well-known Sephardic family of um, what are called hidden Jews, or those who practiced Judaism in secret after being forced to convert to Catholicism following the Spanish Inquisition. We do know, however, that Meyer Hart lived in Germany as well as an English-speaking country. He spoke both English and German. Um, and that he came to America at a very young age. 
Meyer Hart is recorded as being one of the original 11 founders of the village of Easton, as well as its wealthiest and most prominent merchant. His store was most likely located on the northwest corner of Northampton and Hamilton Streets. Hamilton has since been renamed to Fourth Street. He lived in one of the few stone houses in town on the north side of Northampton Street between Bank and Fourth Street. Hart was also a substantial contributor to the 1775 fundraising undertaken to build the village's first school. In addition, he donated 20 pounds of nails to the construction of the German Reformed Church, now known as the First United Church of Christ. This is on uh, North Third Street. The church um, likewise commemorated his gift by installing a stained glass Star of David window at the rear of the building, which can still be seen today. So if you've ever wondered why there's a stained glass window inside of a church, it's, it's because of Meyer Hart. Um, next slide, please. Meyer Hart, Deshira, as discussed previously, is often confused with another successful Hart in Easton, whose name is Michael Hart. His store was in the southeast corner of Center Square, where the Jacob Meyer building now stands. If you know it as one Center Square, the concert venue, it's in that location. Both men, both Hearts, were successful businessmen and competitors, but Michael Hart came to Easton nearly 30 years after Meyer Hart had already settled and prospered here. Michael Hart was born in Bavaria in southeastern Germany and is believed to have come to Easton at least in part because most of the population here spoke German. When he arrived in Easton in 1773, the village was already an important commercial center um, and thus he took an opportunity, took the opportunity to set up his business in this small growing but yet bustling town. In 1778, Michael purchased a lot on the southeast corner of the public square. This was very convenient for him because the public square at that point was the center of town life. He was right across from the courthouse and thus he would have been at the major intersection in town. Next slide, please. Michael Hart's business eventually outstripped Meyer Hart's and he was able to bring his three eldest sons into business with him. Uh, the second son, Jacob, became the first Jewish official in Easton and was elected Justice of the Peace. And we just saw Jacob Hart's portrait in the previous slide. He was the um, a very successful son of Michael Hart. Yep, there he is, very dignified gentleman. Now, for, um, for a very short introduction to um, Easton's area of resources and commerce, by the 1830s, Easton was the largest town in Pennsylvania north of Philadelphia, and it had a population of around 3,800 people. With the building of the Delaware and Lehigh Canals, Easton became a major shipping center for many Lehigh Valley resources, including coal, iron ore, cement, slate, and timber. In 1834, the Common School Act, also known as the Free School Act, made public education available to everyone through local tax funding. Most classes in Pennsylvania were taught in German at this point, as that was the most common language that was spoken in the region. It proved logical then for Jewish immigrants to settle in Easton, both because of the economic opportunities in the region, as well as the area's large German speaking population. These opportunities would have eased their fears and made life in a new country seem less intimidating. And the photo that you are looking at now is a photo of the lock tender's house on the Lehigh Canal. Uh, next slide, please. Now the Jewish presence in Easton remained pretty small for the next several decades, um, but the new immigrants that arrived in the 1830s began to rebuild the Jewish presence in town. In the 1830s, Bavarian Jews began to move into the United States in greater numbers, fleeing increasingly restrictive laws that were enacted against them following the Napoleonic Wars. Of the 83 naturalizations recorded during this time, 40 are from Bavaria, so roughly 50% of them. As of 1855, most of them were roaming peddlers whose responsibilities included selling necessities to those living out in the countryside. We can assume thus that many peddlers then eventually became the merchant class and oftentimes they would set up shop with the same merchandise they had once sold on peddlers wagons. Um, the photo that we're looking at here is from a typical village in Bavaria, I believe from the 1880s. Next slide, please. 
So this background information leads us to the location of Moses Menline Cigar Store on South Third Street. Um, unfortunately, the, this location was lost during the urban redevelopment era of the 60s and the 70s. Um, and so the, um, the Alpha building now stands where this cigar store would have been. Tobacconists at this time not only provided chewing and smoking tobacco products, um, but they also needed to possess detailed knowledge of things like the scents of their tobacco, the colors, the textures, what, that, what all these different types of tobacco would have tasted like. Moses Menline himself um, became quite famous in the early 1900s for what he called Planter's Delight, was his own special blend of tobacco. Um, now that was popular, um, excuse me, um, among Eastern residents, but his, all, his personal charm also made his store um, a rendezvous point for many of the city's leading citizens who would gather there on a daily basis to discuss business matters, financial matters, political matters, and just have a place to relax after a long work day. So tobacconists like Menline provided not only a product, but a social place to gather and hear and debate daily news and relax. Um, interesting to note that the, um, the figure that you see in front of the cigar store, those were, at the time, they were popularly known as cigar store Indians. Um, mm -hmm. They, unfortunately, they were very much caricatures and stereotypes, um, and many indigenous communities have spoken out against the use of these. Um, they were similar to how barber shops would have a barber pole outside of their shop. Um, so we, as NCHGS, we actually hold the original figurine in our archives. So we don't have it on display, but we do, um, we do have ensured that it is preserved and taken care of. So you have that, the one that we see in this picture, you have that. Yes, we have it in our archives. Wow, wow, okay. It's, it's quite large, it's something like yeah, six feet tall, yeah. Wow, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, next slide, please. So unfortunately, this photo is not from Easton itself. This is a photo of um, riots during the kosher meat wars in the early 20th century. Uh, name is a little bit misleading. Obviously, it was not a, an actual war, um, but many, many Jewish immigrants were upset um, in New York City in particular over the rise of kosher meat prices, um, and that is where this photograph is from. Um, now, before Route 22 was installed, 4th Street actually extended down all the way to the Bushkill Creek. In the mid-1800s, that location served as the home of the slaughterhouses of Jacob and Joseph Moses. The two Moses cousins came to the city in 1844, having already experienced um, much work in cattle dealing in Germany and bringing their trade with them to America. Jacob Moses would then take his young sons with him to Buffalo, New York, uh, buy a herd of cattle from dealers, and then drive it back home on the road, walking the entire way. Uh, this is a journey which would have taken him roughly an entire month to complete. Um, so once he gets his cattle back in Easton, to the delight of the local children, the herds would be driven through the streets of Easton and down to the slaughterhouses. Uh, so we can imagine quite the ruckus that ensued if a, if a cattle were to get out of line and start rampaging through the streets. So take that photo with you. And if you ever think Easton <laughs> is a dull town, just imagine a cattle on the loose. Next slide, please. This is the Soldiers and Sailors Monument that is, um, that is now in the circle or the square in downtown Easton. Now, while the Soldiers and Sailors Monument was built to recognize veterans of the Civil War in particular, every Jewish family in the town was represented on the muster rolls during every conflict in Easton's history, from the Revolutionary War up to the present. Among the 400 Easton men who enlisted during the Civil War, um, approximately 104 of them, or 26%, were Jewish. We also know that 72 Jewish men enlisted to fight in World War II, uh, I'm sorry, in World War I, and while we do not have numbers, unfortunately, of the men who fought in World War II, we do know that in 1939, the Jewish citizens of Easton founded the Jewish Community Council, which, um, and I'm quoting uh, Rabbi Trachtenberg here, through its resettlement committee, sponsored the settlement of some two dozen German Jewish families, 
helped to put them on their feet economically and tided them over during the difficult period of adjustment to the American scene. Next slide, please. This is the Abel Opera House. Um, this was located where our Sigel Museum now stands today. And I won't spend too, too much time on this, um, this particular stop, but this was a very fine three-story structure that was considered one of the finest opera houses in the area. It opened with a performance of Hamlet in 1873. Wow. Even today, the Sigel Museum actually retains um, a painted panel from the opera house in its second floor <laughs> visual gallery. So we, we do have a painted section um, of the wall that we have preserved that you can go and look at. That's neat. Turn the page here. These may be uh, transposed. I, I think they're in the right order, but nope, you're good. You're good. Okay. Um, wait, wait. Before you start, is, am I looking at where? Is this where the uh, the Bayou Easton is? Kind of. Is it is. Order? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. It is. All right. Good work. <laughs> um, actually, the no. These may be out of order. What well, is it? This one. Oh, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. There we go. And this, this is, of course. First close. Yeah. We're good. Guys, I swear we practice this. We're fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Jews were also very prominent in Easton's hotel business. Abe Gardner ran the Lafayette Hotel at the corner of Northampton and 4th Streets, now known as the Hotel Lafayette, in 1887. Uh, Solomon Strauss, who actually began as another cigar manufacturer, operated the Rocky Mountain House at 6th and Northampton Streets for a time. Solomon's father, Moses Strauss, ran the only Jewish hostel in Easton. The Fourth Ward Hotel, as it was called, opened around 1870 and was located at the heart and the social center of the Dutch town neighborhood, which we will talk about um, in an upcoming stop. This hotel was known for serving kosher meals and maintaining a homey Jewish atmosphere that was very comforting to newly arrived immigrants that were desperate to have a little bit of a, a taste of home, if you will. Residents of the Dutchtown neighborhood would gather here for parties and in later on in the decade as East European immigrants began to filter into Easton, they too stayed here until they had acclimated to life in the United States. Next slide, please. Yeah, so this is what the building looks like today. It has been really gorgeously restored. Um, if you ever get the chance to eat in there, um, you can you can see what the, the building more or less looks like what it would have looked like then. We can move on. There we go. So a few other merchants from around this time, about the 1870s, are worth mentioning. Now the building on the right of the photo here is now the Bayou. And if you look towards the left of the photo, you can kind of see where it says Khan's Art Gallery in the top left-hand corner. Yep. Yeah, Emmanuel Khan was a veteran of the Franco-Prussian War, War who refused to stay in his Alsatian home under German rule. He migrated to Easton in 1873. He worked as a gilder and a wood finisher initially. And after 10 years, he opened up a small framing shop with his woodworking skills, which then expanded into a well-known art gallery. So the, this guy had quite a few talents under his belt. Um, Khan supplied well-to-do families in the neighboring counties with pieces, desired pieces of mansions, as Trachtenberg wrote, including hmm. paintings, statues, immense mirrors with gilded frames and the like. Another memorable mind of his time, um, and this, this story is absolutely fascinating to me, um, his name was Samuel, ba Samuel Bachenheimer. Um, we are told that after failing to make a go of a fruit and oyster stand, he acquired fame as a minor savior of womankind when he introduced the first of the quote-unquote modern gadgets to Easton's and its surroundings, the potato peeler. <laughs> uh, he was the only person to sell a potato peeler in the area, uh, reportedly until some other other merchants caught on to its success. Um, so I just I just think it's like it's one of those things that you never think about the origin of the potato peeler, right? But you know, all it takes is one guy. Well, it's really interesting too. It's like, hey, they, he's the only one who had it, and and everyone sees how great of an idea it is. And nobody else wants to sell it. Like y'all could have made a killing too. <laughs> yeah. sure. Okay. Um, this right. is a really interesting 
Yeah, here we go. I, I am obsessed with these maps. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I'm a history nerd. I work in a museum, right? Um, but this is, we have some of these in our archives as well, but a lot of these are available on the Library of Congress website. Um, so if you type in Sanborn Fire Insurance Company maps, Easton, Pennsylvania, you'll get a, a ton of all the different streets laid out. Um, and if you zoom in really, really well, um, you can't do it on here, but the Library of Congress mm -hmm. has massive files of these. Um, you can actually zoom in and see where certain businesses were and which, like... And um, I could be wrong, but aren't the different colors, like the different materials that they're constructed out of? I Is believe right? so. Um, okay. I'm not that familiar with them, but that, that's what would, um, that would make okay. sense to me. Uh, so the map that we are looking at right now is, I want to say, from the 1870s, but don't don't quote me on that one. Um, but the, the map shows what would have been the Dutchtown neighborhood, um, particularly in the bottom right-hand corner. That would be between Northampton and 6th Street. Michael Hart, that we had talked about before, established Easton's first Jewish cemetery on John Street, which is now 6th Street and Northampton Street on the site of, again, of the current Two Rivers Brewing building. This location marks the edge of a neighborhood called Dutchtown. And at one point, this was the edge of the town, period. So this is where the Jewish community largely settled together in the 19th century. Many of the Jewish immigrants who arrived in Easton, um, a lot of them were farmers and backpack peddlers. They had very little formal learning. They spoke regional German as a variation of their native tongue. Now, after the mid 19th century or so, the Jewish community in Easton stopped growing. Between 1850 and 1890, the number of Jewish families varied only very slightly with a range between 45 to 55 families and a total population of about 250. Eventually, after families moved into Dutchtown after their initial arrival in Easton, after a generation or so, they then moved out of the neighborhood um, and onto different neighborhoods as the city expanded. Okay, I believe we can go to the next slide. All right. Now, this pattern continued into the 19th century, century with the arrival of Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe. So we think of Eastern Europe and Western Russia. Following the assassination of Tsar Alexander II, his successor responded to his assassination with a series of violent pogroms against the Jews in 1881, and then by passing the, what were called the May Laws of 1882. And those laws limited the Jewish areas of residence to the Pale of Settlement, which is what you see on the map in front of you. Now, Jewish immigrants who moved out of the Pale of Settlement and into Pennsylvania specifically um, came primarily from uh, what we know today as the Baltic states, from Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Primarily in the eastern area, they came from Lithuania. Um, Poland, what we would call today Belarus, Galicia, and the Ukraine and they came westward across the Atlantic. Some of these young men, um, most from what we can tell, seem to be, uh, would have been in their, their teens or their 20s and unmarried, came to Easton around 1882, um, and very likely they wrote back home and encouraged other family members to migrate as well. Next slide, please. Many newly arrived immigrants, as we said, they stayed in Strauss's Fort Ward Hotel in Dutchtown. One of the very earliest Russian immigrants, Daniel Borovsky, ran a boarding house for immigrants on West Street. Um, and Trachtenberg writes that he put them up at 15 cents a night with hours of sleep strictly governed by his wife, who, who was in the habit of pulling the pillows out from under the heads of the lazy ones. Uh, so if you, if you think your parents are rough on you now, <laughs> imagine how it was in the 1870s. They would just straight pull a pillow out from under you. Um, <laughs> And we can, um, I know we're kind of short on time, so we can just go. No, it's on. okay. Yeah, we'll continue. Okay. Um, this is a depiction of a painting of a prayer service in Leningrad, I want to say the early 20th century. Um, and Russian Jews differed from their German predecessors in many ways. Um, as Trachtenberg writes, they came from an environment that was far more distinctive and distinctively Jewish, and therefore all the more markedly unlike the one in which they now found themselves. 
The Judaism that these newly arrived Jews were practicing was based both on folk practices and on a wide acquaintance with literary sources. Now, remember that um, Jews coming from Eastern Europe had been very, they had been forced to be very isolated in the Pale of Settlement. Um, actually, Jews were not allowed to settle in cities or towns with over a certain population. Um, so they were very much forced to live in, in insulated and isolated communities. So as uh, these newly arrived Jews are coming in um, in the 1870s and 1880s, they, um, they are meeting with the German Jews who had come here in the 1830s. And these, these groups were sort of cool and sometimes kind of bitter with each other. Um, the earlier settlers, the German Jews, they were, at this point, they were very well established. They considered themselves more acculturated and assimilated and very much a part of the American scene. And they wanted nothing to do with the newly arrived Eastern European Jews. Um, there was also a, a bit of a class issue um, with the German Jews believing themselves to be um, like a step above the Eastern European Jews. Um, similarly, um, interestingly enough, the, the Eastern European Jews didn't understand um, the, the faith that the German Jews had now been practicing. Um, they considered the reform movement very watered down, um, sort of strange and very, um, not unorthodox, not like pun intended, um, but these, right. these differences then led to a split in the Jewish congregation and the formation of a completely new synagogue. Next slide, please. So this is the Temple Covenant of Peace that was on the location of 6th Street between Pine and Ferry. Um, now, uh, in, a synagogue is a center of religious, religious life, of course, but also social life, educational life, and a center of community. Um, Congregation Covenant of Peace, or Brit Shalom, was established on August 26, 1839. It became the third Jewish Congress um, congregation excuse me, in Pennsylvania and the 10th oldest congregation in the United States. Wow. So the, the congregation, as we saw earlier in that sketch drawing, they rented a small house that was likely on Spring Garden Street and worshipped there for several years until they outgrew the space. In March of 1842, members approved a plan to build a permanent synagogue on uh, Pine and Ferry, uh, between Pine and Ferry on 6th Street. Um, and the, the facade on the outside was actually modeled off of a synagogue, I believe in Florence, Italy. Now, when it was built in, the, um, in 1842, the congregation adhered to Orthodox practices. That, that was all that was practiced at the time. In 1870, after a visit to Easton by Isaac Meyer Wise, who was the founder of the reform movement in America, the congregation members decided to take the synagogue in this direction, um, thus making Covenant of Peace the 12th earliest reform synagogue in the country. For 117 years, uh, the synagogue on South 6th Street was the oldest synagogue in continuous use in the United States, which wow. is just incredible that, that something like yeah. that would, would happen in our very tiny town, right? right? The last service there was held November 20th, 1959, when the congregation moved to 1451 Northampton Street, and the Second Baptist Church took over the, the building mm -hmm. that we see here. Um, unfortunately, the building burned down to the ground in 2004. Um, many debate whether or not the fire was deliberate or not. I can't say mm. for certain, um, and I don't want to cause any drama on the Passport History Facebook group right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll move on to the next slide. Okay. Oops, sorry. Okay, here we go. There we go. Um, so in response to the many cultural barriers between themselves and the German congregation, as we discussed previously, Easton's Eastern European Jews took the first steps towards establishing their own congregation called B'nai Abraham in 1888. In the newly formed congregation, worship continued to follow traditional Orthodox practices, with the first regular meeting place of the congregation in a room on the top floor of the Mount Vernon Her Hotel at the corner of Northampton and 6th Street. We just keep coming back to this building. Yeah. <laughs> on April 1st, 1898, an abandoned volunteer firehouse at 323 Lehigh Street was purchased, where the ground floor was actually rented out as a furniture warehouse, and the congregation moved into the upper story. 
by 1900, the membership had increased to 50 people. And unfortunately, that original building, um, it, it had gone through a number of changes after it was a synagogue, um, but that building itself was lost also in the urban renewal projects. In 1906, just eight years after purchasing their first building, the B'nai Abraham Congregation purchased a plot of land at 128 South 6th Street, which is the building you see here today. I think... No, we can stay at this stop. Um, okay. So by, by the 1920s, B'nai Abraham too was struggling between, uh, with the tensions between tradition and change. Yiddish, the, the, the language that many of them spoke was increasingly seen as, as old fashioned. Um, it was something that the older generations would speak while the newer, younger generations um, were acclimating to the American scene mm -hmm. and English more. Um, so as, as one historian put it, they were dealing with the, the failure of the old ideal of learning to survive in a new country and absorption into business affairs. Um, so members were formally still orthodox, but personally they were becoming more distant from a very thoroughgoing um, identification with strict orthodox ritual and theology. Um, so a, a small faction actually split off from B'nai Abraham in 1914. They called themselves the Children of Israel Semi-Reformed Congregation. Um, they were frustrated with the very strict Orthodox traditions. They adopted a little bit more of reform practices, such as seating men and women together during service. Um, but membership remained small, and within three years, it had been reabsorbed into B'nai Abraham. By 1937, a conservative rabbi, not an Orthodox rabbi, uh, was serving the B'nai Abraham congregation. And by 1944, the synagogue had come to regard itself as more conservative rather than Orthodox. And we can move on to the next slide. This was the most fascinating photo, I, just because it, it shows, you know, it, it was the, the closest photo of, mm. of people, you know, really showing them. I just found it fascinating to look at everybody. Yes, and uh, unfortunately, the, the building that they are in front of also no longer exists, mm. um, but we'll, we'll get to that as well. Okay. Um, so uh, aside from the problem of people drifting away from organized practice during the first few decades of the 20th century, this time was also marked by a concerted effort by young people um, to form organizations where young Jews could meet and socialize in a non-religious setting. So in 1910, the Young Men and Young Women's Hebrew Association was founded. It began with 12 members, but had doubled in membership the following year. In 1915, the group went ahead with a fundraiser to purchase a house of their own. They raised $25,000 in 15 days, which wow. it would be remarkable in 2022, yeah. much less in 1915, <laughs> right? right. Um, and they bought a house at Ferry and Walnut Street and that building became a neighborhood center for the Jewish community at large and served in that capacity for decades. Um, the building, which was, again, was located at 650 Ferry Street, was later raised to the ground and was rebuilt. And today it is the Northampton County Juvenile Justice Center. And this is a, a group of um, football players, I believe, in front of the Jewish Community Center. Next slide, please. Yeah. A lot of people love all this stuff, too. That's wonderful. That makes me so happy. Uh, many of us spent um, close to a year putting um, the, the text and the, the yeah. tour and the photos and on the platform together. So we, we really want um, as many people as possible to enjoy yeah. this tour and to learn um, about the history of this community. Um, so we're almost there. Thank, thank you for bearing with me for 40 no, minutes. No, we're good. We're good. Let's go. <laughs> okay. Continue on. All right. Um, now, the, the Reform community, Temple Covenant of Peace, was also having trouble during this time. The first 15 years of the 20th century had seen a downturn of membership. This quiet period began to change, fortunately, in the 1930s and 1940s. The movement, um, as Trachtenberg writes, the movement of manufacturing plants out of larger cities during that time and into the Lehigh Valley brought a number of Jewish businesses to the area. Um, and they produced items such as uh, everything you can think of from electrical coils to curtains to machinery to furs and hats and dresses and clothing. Um, 
and by 1942, the Jewish community of Easton and the surrounding areas had grown from 45 families to 450 by the 1940s. Um, the post-World War II years saw both congregations grow even more. In 1954, Congregation Brit Shalom, Covenant of Peace, purchased the old Hay Estate at 15th and Northampton Streets and built a new synagogue there. In the 1960s, B'nai Abraham purchased land on Bushkill Street for a new synagogue, which opened in 1965. Um, so it was, ironically, um, at about the same time in the, the mid-20th century that both congregations, which were located um, just mm -hmm. a block away from each other on South 6th Street, both moved um, out to 15th and Northampton and Bushkill Streets. Um, and when they moved, they only moved about a half a mile from each other again. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's that's um, incredible in a, in a rapidly growing town to be so close right, together right. and then to move and so to close stay together. And then move well. and find, be close again, right? Yeah. So on the, the photo here, this is a photo from the NCHGS collection um, in our lower level exhibit, Destination Northampton County. We do have a Jewish community exhibit. And these are some of the boxes from um, many of the Jewish owned businesses that were in Easton. In the and, and some of the most famous businesses in the Lehigh Valley history ever. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Um, and you'll, you'll notice too, um, the, the big box on the right hand side, the white one, it says Sigils on it. Um, so that is, I would like to note, that is oh, where yeah. the name of our museum comes from, the Sigil family who ran a women's clothing and later a bridal business on the site of the Sickle Museum for close to 40 years. Wow. Um, and the Sickle yeah. family was really instrumental um, in helping the, the museum literally and figuratively get off the ground. Okay. So we, okay. we owe very much to them. Um, so we'll go on to our last stop. So like Easton's overall population, the Jewish community has dwindled since the 1980s when the completion of um, Interstate 78 from New York through Lehigh Valley brought in an influx of new families to the area. Membership in the two synagogues has declined from their heyday in the mid 1900s um, when each congregation had about 250 families to fewer than 100 families today. The 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 Y, as it came to be called, the community center closed in the late 1970s and the day camp closed in the 1980s. The Jewish Federation of the Lehigh Valley commissioned a demographic study in 2007, which determined that there was a total of 4,000 Jewish households in the Lehigh Valley um, with approximately 8,000 Jewish persons living in them. Although this does mean that 2% of the Lehigh Valley is Jewish, making it the third largest community in the state, um, there simply were not enough members and families to keep two synagogues um, to allow them both to remain open um, with all of their operating costs. So in order to keep a thriving Jewish community in Easton, Congregation Brit Shalom, Temple Covenant of Peace, and Congregation B'nai Abraham, Sons of Abraham, remember they had, uh, they had split Right. In the 1880s, right? Um, so on August 1st, 2020, um, both synagogues merged once again to become Congregation B'nai Shalom, Congregation Children of Peace. They are today, they consider themselves a reform temple. The building that housed Temple Covenant of Peace at 1451 Northampton Street has been sold. Um, ironically, there was a church on the site now, um, which I think is is one of the great things about Easton, how we, um, all of our religious communities work so well together and come together and help out each other when, when we need it the most. Um, so both merged congregations are now occupying the, uh, the old B'nai, B'nai Abraham um, location on Bushkill Street. Mm -hmm. And Rabbi Melody Davis, who was the rabbi of Temple Covenant of Peace, is now the rabbi for both congregations. Um, and she is very optimistic um, about the future, quoting that, I think we will be a much stronger, more vibrant congregation together. Uh, and so that is the Jewish history of Easton in 45 years. <laughs> <laughs> I have to commend you, because I went through it and I read, you know, I went over the tour and there's so much information I mean, when you're doing this on your own, um, mm -hmm. what's great about it, like you said, you'll be able to take in all this information at each stop at your at your uh, leisure. Um, right. And I just want to make sure for everyone who's watching who who wants to maybe get more of the information, I'll put this on screen. 
This is the QR code that will take you directly to the, the site where you're able to get the premium content. But the easiest way, of course, uh, we're looking at seagullmuseum.org. And if you go to events up top, just as Sarah said, and you scroll, whoop, if you scroll to the bottom, you can sign up right here. Um, and, and that's something that the, people can do today. Right? Yes. If, if they want to yes, sign up or, or they could do it something this weekend if they're, if they're trying, looking for something to do. Yes. I do want to reiterate as well that, um, yes. so the tour is over 20 stops, right? Um, and yep. the tour, because it is a virtual tour, it moves chronologically. So you'll find okay. yourself at pr the same location, perhaps two or three times. Um, when Liz Rosen initially wrote the tour, it was more of um, location based, um, mm -hmm. but in order to make it virtual, it just made more sense to have it moving chronologically. So I would absolutely recommend maybe do um, two or three stops, sit down, digest the information, right. <laughs> um, and then move on. Yep. But it is so neat too, I mean, to actually be out in your community mm -hmm. and being at these places of history and being to, able to learn about them in real time, which is uh, fantastic that you were able to, to distill it even into to 45 minutes here, which has been <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. And that's what I mean. We usually go for 30 minutes, but I, I think we have so many people watching. In fact, uh, Kathy, you just commented. It was very fascinating and educational. So Sarah, you're um, being able to do this. And I know that you did this on short notice as well. So I just want to doubly thank you for taking the time tonight to, to give everybody a, a brief overview of this fantastic tour and to give us some more information on how to, to visit. Yes. And I, so. I thank you very much as well, as well as our passport to history team. Um, Absolutely. I mean, this is, this is very much a team effort, right? We, we all came together at the last minute. Yes. We were like, what can we do? Wait, we've got one. Um, so thank um, you to, to you, George, and to our Lehigh Valley passport with history folks for being so flexible and so accommodating and wonderful. Absolutely. And again, to everybody, visit lvhistory.org, seagullmuseum.org. I still have canals.org in there. You know what? You might as well go to them <laughs> as well. Uh, <laughs> there's so much to do in the Lehigh Valley. This weekend is going to be beautiful. Hit up lvhistory.org. Find something to do. Sarah, thank you so much for giving us uh, a quick overview of this really in-depth, important uh, historical tour of, of Easton. Thank you for having me so much. And thank you to everybody who watched this evening and we'll catch you next month. Thanks for joining us.